<laughs> there's small differences in everything that we come across. If you're a Mississippi State fan, there's a big difference yesterday than what we've seen before. 600 passing yards in a single game. Mississippi State has never seen that. Ever. And so it's a, there's a difference, right? Uh, what are um, the difference? Sometimes these differences are so small that we can't even see that there's a difference at all. But what about in our spiritual lives? Is there a difference? Jesus calls us to be salt and light in Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says that you'll know them by their fruits. If you look at what the Bible teaches, there's a stark contrast between a believer and a non-believer. Those that are followers of Christ, those that have experienced the goodness of God and the grace of His salvation, there's a true life change. But the question is, is there really, how big of a difference is it? Is it something that's just minor and we really can't tell the difference or is there something that, that's major? We're looking at how godly love, how godly characteristics impact our lives so much so that it influences the way that we do life outwardly. It begins to change us inwardly and so that the way we do life externally looks completely different than what it did before Christ. We looked at godly love last week and how this love should be the catalyst, the driving force behind every part of ministry. We looked at how it redefines everything that we are. And this today may not seemingly be a characteristic, but it's a word that we use a lot, and it's a word we call salvation. It's what we've sung about all morning. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 is where we're going to be at today as we dive in to this idea of salvation being part of the difference. We're lost, now found, we're depraved, and reflect now as sons, as daughters, right? We were, we were lost, we didn't have any place, but now we're heirs to the king. We were dead, and now we are alive. We cannot, we must not take this lightly as believers, and we must feel the urgency of the gospel as believers in the faith family. So if you're there in Ephesians chapter 2, would you stand with me this morning in the reverence reading of God's Word if we begin reading in verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 2. Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your grace. God, thank you for this word, salvation. God, this word that took lost sinners and now made them alive in Christ. And God, I just pray that your word would manifest itself, that your presence would manifest itself in our presence today. God, that you would change our hearts, break our hearts for what breaks yours. God, bring dead people alive today. God, if you can use me in a part of that, then God, please do. If not, get me out of the way that we see you in the fullness of your glory. In your name alone, God, we pray. I love you. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So if you're in the habit of taking notes, number one, our status. Number one, our status. Paul is right to the church at Ephesus and a, a very, very strong um, core body of believers. And he says, you. And you were dead and trespasses and sins and whence you were once walked. We tend to view ourselves through the lens of the world, don't we? We begin to think about all the bad things that happen around us and we begin to, to watch the news and we hear and we read on media and social media and we think about all this bad stuff that happens. Rape, murder, wars, all of this stuff, poverty, all of these bad things. And, and we begin to look at that and we begin to compare ourselves and look at ourselves in the mirror and while we begin to say, I don't do this and I don't do that. I'm involved with church and I've got all this stuff. I give and I go and I, and I serve and I live selflessly and I do this. Everyone else is the problem around me. Everyone else is the bad issue. Everyone else is bad and I, I've kind of got my stuff together. But if we begin to really think about what the Bible teaches, the main reason that there is evil in the world is when I look in the mirror. 
When I look in the mirror, I am evil at my core. We begin to think about sin as something that we take part in, and sin is something as an action that we do. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not sinners because we occasionally sin. We sin because we are at the core a sinner. Come on. We are evil and we are no, no good. We tend to think of sin as an outward response of disobedience, but sin is actually our identity. It is who we were. There are no good people in the Bible. It is only bad people and Jesus. We begin to think about how we live our lives and how we fill our lives with religion and we fill our lives with good things and all this good stuff. But Paul says, and you. You, me. It's not that, that your pastor has a, a lot of faith. It's not that your mom and dad have a lot of faith and so you're dependent on them. No, you. It is an individual problem. It is not something that we issue with. It, sin is a terminal disease. Our status is defined by our individual disobedience to God. Paul says, and you were dead in trespasses in which you once walked. Uh, Paul says that you were dead. Dead means you were deprived of life, lacking power to move, feel, or respond, incapable of being stirred emotionally or intellectually. Sin is not actions that we partake in, right? It's a, it's a terminal condition. Ladies and gentlemen, we weren't just sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. We were floating corpses that have drowned in the sea of our disobedience. We were completely dead. There was nothing that we could do on our own merit. We were dead. Paul says you were dead in your sin. You were dead in who you are. You, a dead person has no identity. A dead person has no purpose. A dead person has no meaning. It has no life. Paul says not only were you dead, but you were also following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in sons of disobedience, the devil, among whom we all Come on, that's a collective word that we all once walked and lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul says you were not only dead, but you were also evil. You followed the devil, and by nature you were enemies of God. We have, we people, humanity has an I problem. You begin to think about sin, it's I in. I want to be king. I want to make the rules. I want to call the shots. I want mine and forget you. I want to take care of me. I want to take care of us. Y'all y'all still with me? This is extreme, isn't it? All right, right, right. As you think about it, right, if we begin to think about our church context, we begin to think about us and what we do. This is extreme, isn't it? Paul, is this really what we need today in, in 2020? Are you really saying that all of my good stuff doesn't mean anything? Are you really saying that my religious activity doesn't really add up? Or is that really what it is? I mean, there are good things in the world. I don't really do that much bad. But ladies and gentlemen, we have a man's perspective of sin. Paul says in Romans 5, 12, that therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sin. Think about it. The reason that we die, the reason that there is bad in the world, the reason why you can't watch the news without being depressed is because someone ate a fruit. Sin is a big deal. Our status changed. We went from being alive. We went from having everything that we needed, and we decided we didn't want that anymore because we wanted it our way. My sin literally killed me. I committed suicide spiritually when I sinned against God. You see, if we misdiagnose the problem, we won't prescribe the cure correctly. Do you, do you hear me? That if we don't understand where we were before Christ, we can't appreciate where we are in Christ. If we don't understand that we had nothing of our own, we must see our sin through the lens of God to fully understand what the difference is. Could it be that the difference isn't just necessarily being lost and found? Could it, the difference very well be that we were dead and now we're alive? Come on. Number one, our status. Number two, God's character. I want to read this again. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which, you once, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God. Come on, somebody. But who is rich 
in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses he made us alive together with Christ God's character but God can we just rest in that for a moment we were dead but God for the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord ladies and gentlemen our livelihood the breath in our lungs hang on but God God, who is rich in mercy, with great love, poured out everything on Jesus on the cross so that we would have a way to breathe, that we would have life, that we would have breath in our lungs. Notice that this is all past tense. It's not that God is continually having to do something. He made us alive when He raised Christ from the dead and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Our deadness, our no purpose, our no meaning of life, our breathless lungs were taken care of on the cross. What this means is God is actively pursuing us through every point of salvation. God is running when God ran. God is chasing after His people. God is chasing after His children through every part, which means He initiated it all. It means that I had nothing to do with it because I was dead. What did dead people do? Nothing. They can't. They have no functionality. If I was dead, that means I could have played no role, no active part in my salvation. It had to be God. God initiated it all. God brought it all in. God made it all happen. But Think about this, though. Think about it from uh, the, what we normally think. The question that we normally ask is, why would a loving God allow people to go to hell? But the question could also be, how could a just God offer repentance? It's a paradox. If we know something about God, let's walk back to the Old Testament. Is it God hates sin? Psalm 11.5 says, The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Uh, like we, we hear all the time that God uh, hates the sin and loves the sinner, but if sin is who we were, that means God's wrath was, we were in the scope of God's wrath. We were in the scope of God's judgment. We were standing there and we were guilty as charged. We were dead in our trespasses in which we once walked. We had done all of the bad things wrong. We had not done all of the good things well. We were dead and we were guilty in that moment. And our question always says, well, how can a merciful God uh, allow grace and repentance? Or how can he allow people to go to hell? And how can there be judgment? And how can there be punishment? And how can there be eternal separation from God if God's love? But if God is just, and if God is a righteous and holy God, then how can there be repentance? How can he look at our sin and say, not guilty? How can he look at us and say, it's okay? You see, the cross was a crossroads of God's wrath and God's grace. Well, as we begin to look at the cross, and we begin to think of what God did for us, but God being rich in mercy through Christ made us alive. His wrath, His love, and His mercy met at the cross. His wrath was taken care, taken care of and satisfied by the death of Jesus. And His love and His grace and His mercy was exemplified through the death of Jesus. God's character towards His people is love and grace and mercy for a deserving punishment. This is God's character to us. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. And Jesus died the death that I deserve to die. Jesus forgave us, but what does that really mean? It means that He absorbed God's wrath that was coming for me. The wrath of the Creator of the universe, the holy and just King, was coming for me. And Jesus said, I'll take that. Because God told Him to. This is God's character. God cannot stand to look upon sin, so something had to take my sin's place for the wages of sin is death. Something had to die that was enough to cover my sin. And it wasn't an animal because the animal had to be sacrificed over and over and over again. It had to be Jesus. This is God's character. Jesus died instead of me. Number three, salvation's outcome. 
Number three, salvation's outcome. I love Ephesians 8 through 10. If you've been here and you've been at Rocky Point since I've been here, I think you've heard it probably every Sunday. I love it. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing, lest any man should boast, because we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he has predetermined beforehand. Salvation's outcome. Paul says the basis of our salvation is the grace of God. We had nothing to do with it. And the, it is lived out through faith in God. But that faith now results in the works of God. We begin to think, uh, if you think about us, whether we mean to or not, it is our habit, it is our tendency to lean towards, well, I go to Sunday school, and I go to church, and I tithe, and I have all these talents, and I serve, and all that stuff. But salvation is a gift to be received, not a prize to be earned. Salvation is something that is a free gift of God. That God, who lavished his love on the cross for us in the, the being of Jesus Christ, his son, uh, he poured it all out so that we could have life. Salvation is a gift that we receive. There's nothing that we can do about it. God has done it all. We have no part in it, but now what? See, there, there's this gap between now and the midnight cry that we sang about, right? But our tendency is, let me justify my life with all this religious activity until that day comes. Right? Well, we're, just, we're just sitting here waiting on heaven. We're just hanging out and we're just kind of doing our own thing. We've come to Christ. We've made a, a public statement of faith. We've even been baptized and made that public. Not that there's any power in water, but that water is exemplifying the, what God has already done to me. And now what? Okay, now what do I do? What's next? We are now alive, is what. We were dead, and now we're alive. We have breath, now we have meaning, now we have purpose. The word that Paul uses is workmanship. It means poem. It's the same word that is used in Genesis chapter 1, where God creates the, the world. In the beginning, God created, and as God begins to go through creation, He begins to look back and say it's good. This same word for workmanship is used in Genesis in the creation story. I don't know if you realize what that means. What that means is that because of the work of Jesus Christ, you are his perfect masterpiece. Not because of anything that you did, but because of the work that Jesus did for you on the cross. You are his workmanship and his most prized possession. Anybody ever uh, watched a series or read a series of books and like you know from the beginning in, in episode one that there's supposed to be five episodes, but for some reason they stop at episode three? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Come on, somebody. Y'all feel me? Y'all be reading these stories and y'all be watching these shows and it's set up for it to come again. But for some reason, because it wasn't, it wasn't as um, profitable as they thought it would be or somebody quits or whatever, they just stop. So they leave it open-ended at the end of episode three or book three and never write or display episode four or book four. It leaves you hungry and like, what in the world happened, right? Y'all, y'all, y'all help me out. Y'all tracking with me. Maybe, maybe I'm just crazy, okay? I, that's possible. God didn't do that. God didn't leave you waiting for more. Every good poem by a good author is complete. Every good book by a good author is complete. His poem, his masterpiece, God is going to start and finish God is going to finish what he started with Jesus on the cross in your life. God is not finished with you, believer. You are his workmanship that created in Christ Jesus for good works that he had predetermined beforehand that we should walk in them. God saved you. God brought you alive for a purpose, and that purpose wasn't to just sit here and wait on heaven. That purpose was to be the salt and the light. That purpose was to display the fruits of the Spirit. That purpose was to be driven by the godly love that you've experienced to a lost and dying world. The question that we have to ask, do I love the gospel? Do I love the gospel? Because let's be honest, the way we think about the gospel is that I was a bad person and God made me good. 
But the reality of the gospel is I was dead and now I'm alive. Two completely different meanings. Two completely different concepts. That I was lifeless. No purpose. No meaning. And now I have breath in my lungs. And, and do we love the gospel? Do we long and hunger for that? There's urgency because if you are a follower of Christ, you are among dead men walking. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel is called out into a valley by the Spirit of the Lord in a vision. And in this valley, is, it's just a graveyard. It's just like a, where a battle had been fought and there's bones everywhere. It's full of dried bones. They had been there a while. There's no flesh remaining on these bones. It's in the desert valley, and it's just bones everywhere. And God begins to take Ezekiel through the valley, and they begin to look, and all around there's bones everywhere. And God looks at Ezekiel and says, Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel says, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. So God says, prophesy to the bones. Ezekiel prophesies to the bones, and lo and behold, these bones begin to come together, and there's a great rattling that takes place in the valley. And bone begins to connect to bone, and organs begin to form, and blood vessels begin to form, and tendons and muscle begins to form, and skin begins to come uh, on, the, on the skeletons, and then the, the hair begins to come, and the eyes begin to come, and then all of a sudden, there's a valley of people. But Ezekiel chapter 37 says there's a valley of people now, but they're still dead. There's no life in them, Ezekiel chapter 37 says. So then God comes back to Ezekiel and says, Now prophesy to the breath. Prophesy to the breath. The ruah, the spirit of God, is what the Hebrew word is that's used. So Ezekiel obeys God and he begins to prophesy to the breath. And the breath comes and it enters into these bones. And then the Bible says they live. You see, the reality is that we may look put together, but we could still be dead. We can look all good, and we can dress it all up with our religion, and we can dress it all up with our goodness, and we can dress it all up with our busyness, and we can dress it all up, but at the end of the day, we're just dead men walking. Salvation's outcome is that you were breathless and now have breath in your lungs. Salvation's outcome is that you realize that there are people around you just like that. Man, it is hard in the South to get this because we desperately and continually begin to cover up salvation with belief. That doesn't make sense, Daniel. James writes that even the demons believe and they tremble. Belief and life change are two different things. You see it? You follow me? That there is a spirit, the breath of God that enters us, that brings us to life. We were dead. You begin to think about there is a, a seminary professor. And at the beginning of every semester, they would, he would take his class out to a graveyard. Odd, isn't it? And he would begin to tell his students, all right, bring these, bring these people to life. It's weird. So eventually one would muster up enough coverage and they would begin to preach to this grave, just these tombstones. And one by one they would go through and they would preach to this graveyard. Obviously nothing happened. And so after everybody was done, the, the seminary professor would get back up in front of his students and say, you know what, this is what it's like to do life. You begin to take steps at work, and you're among a, t a graveyard. You begin to take steps into the world, and you're among a graveyard. There's a terminal illness, and ladies and gentlemen, you've experienced the cure. How selfish are we to keep it to ourselves? And I'm not saying we are, but I, what I am saying is we need to understand what the difference is. The difference is not that we were just lost and wandering off. The difference was we were completely and utterly dead. We weren't just kind of centering off doing our own thing. We weren't just off playing and dabbling in the world to come back. We were dead and lifeless, only to be made alive by the goodness of God. So what's the difference? 
What is the difference with life itself? So my ask of you today is, do you believe in Jesus or have you experienced him? Have you experienced life? Have you experienced this love poured out? Do you understand the problem? Do you understand the prescription? Do you understand the significance of the gospel? This is the difference. So as we begin to close and, and we get ready to go home, I know it's been a long day, it's been a good day, but if, if you haven't experienced new life, you're just a dead man walking. You look all put together, but you're just a dead man walking. And I'm just going to be real with you. Can I be real with you? If you're sitting at home, I'm going to be real with you all too. As we, if we gather together, there is no magic in walking this aisle. There's no magic in this altar. There is the goodness of God. There is no prayer that I can pray for you. There is nothing that I can do. It is God working in your life. And my ask is, would you receive that? If you're a believer in the house, would you just receive the goodness of God that you reflect on how evil you were and God, thank you, Jesus, that I'm alive. How many times have we done that? How often do we do that, God? Man, I was dead and now I'm alive. God, thank you, Jesus, for life. I mean, how often do we do that? I'm going to pray and we're going to respond in just a moment. And I'm going to be here and, and I'm going to put our deacons on the spot. They're ready. They're ready if you want to talk to one of them. But again, there's no systematic thing that says that's what you have to do. What I'm saying is I believe God's in this place. I believe God's going to move. My, my ask is that you would open your heart to him. We will be glad to assist you We'll be glad to pray with you. We'll be glad to love on you. And we'll be glad to disciple you. But what I'm saying is, the King of Heaven is in this room. His Spirit is in this place. And would you respond to Him? Let's pray. Father, you are good. And God, you have brought dead to life. God, we were dead. And God, you have brought us life. You are rich in mercy. And God, you call us as we are. And God, you meet us where we are. And God, I just ask right now that you would meet us where we are that you would meet us in our brokenness, that you would meet us in our joy, that you would meet us in our worry, that you would meet us in our anxiety, that you would meet us in our goodness, that you would meet us in our times of, of our mountaintop moments, that God, you would meet us in our valley moments, that God, you would just meet us here in this place today. Not for, not for our own benefit, not for this church's benefit, God, not for one way's benefit, but God, for the benefit of the kingdom, that the world may know that you bring dead people to life. Yeah, it's in your name alone we pray, God. I love you. Amen.